Good day and welcome to our UT School of Social Work webinar, Critical Elements for Victim Notification, Planning and Preparing for Change. Our speakers today are Anna Wally, Lieutenant Wita Knowlton, Dr. Noel Bridget Bush Armendariz, and Caitlin Sully. Anna is the administrator of the Rape Crisis Center and the Shelby County Crime Victim Center. She is a social worker with 36 years of experience working in the Memphis area. For the past 20 years, she has worked solely with victims of crime. She represents the victim's voice on the task force and whenever she works within the criminal justice system. Lieutenant Knowlton is a 22-year veteran of the Memphis Police Department. She has worked in the MPD Sex Crimes Unit since 2012 and in the DNA Unit with cold cases since its inception. While working in that unit, she has helped to develop victim-centered protocols, trained officers to interact more compassionately with victims, and has provided them with superb supervision. Her law enforcement experience and educational background have provided her with a unique point of view and enables her to help victims on multiple levels. Dr. Noel Bridget Bush Armendariz is the director of the Institute on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault and is a full professor and the Associate Vice President for Research at the University of Texas at Austin. Her areas of specialization are interpersonal violence, refugees, victims of human trafficking and asylees, and international social work. And Caitlin is Director of Strategic Partnerships and leads the Sexual Assault Research Portfolio at the School of Social Work's Institute on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. She currently oversees research initiatives focused on interpersonal violence, victim-centered practices, and the criminal justice system. So I'm now going to turn the program over to Caitlin, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Matt. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Well, we could, but now you're gone? Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the introduction and to our audience for joining us for this webinar, Critical Elements for Victim Notification, Planning and Preparing for Change. I'd like to thank Lieutenant Knowlton and Anna for presenting with me today and for their contributions to our field, particularly for sharing their insight on developing and implementing victim notification practices. We may have time for a Q&A at the end of the webinar, so you can send in your questions um, throughout the session, and we can also try and respond to you in the chat box. Um, but if we don't have time at the end of the session, we'll respond to your questions after the webinar, and we'll send out the responses to all the attendees, and we appreciate all the questions that you, that you send to us. Um, I'd like to take a moment to share a little bit of information about the Institute on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Um, our mission is to advance knowledge about interpersonal violence through research, education, and service in multidisciplinary strategic partnerships with researchers, educators, practitioners, policymakers, and other members of our community. Our vision is that our efforts enhance the quality and relevance of research findings, their application and service provision, and ultimately their benefit to survivors of interpersonal violence and those who assist them. We approach this work from a multidisciplinary focus, and our partners are the School of Social Work, the School of Law, School of Nursing, and the Bureau for Business Research at the University of Texas at Austin. This project is supported by the Office on Violence Against Women. The opinions, findings, and conclusions, and the recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of IDVSA, and they don't necessarily reflect the views of, the, of OVW. So I'd like to go over real quick our learning objectives. Um, at the end of today's session, we'd like for you to come away with um, increased knowledge of personal, institutional, and organizational factors related to notification, um, increased skills to examine organizational and community variables around notification, and to be able to assess and evaluate opportunities for change based on lessons learned. As part of our victim notification project, we've been thinking about how jurisdictions are approaching the issue of untested sexual assault kits and victim engagement and notification. 
Um, so we settled on the framework of change, which is the process of a community coming together collaboratively to test their sexual assault kits and develop and implement a victim-centered notification protocol. Before change occurs, jurisdictions may or may not be operating in a collaborative framework and may or may not have a victim-centered notification protocol in place. In most cases, jurisdictions will not have been conduct conducting testing of their untested or backlogged sexual assault kits or notification, except to a smaller degree sometimes with um, cold cases, sexual assault cold cases. And after the change, jurisdictions will work in a multidisciplinary team to ethically notify victims using a notification protocol developed specifically for and by their own jurisdiction. The process through which a jurisdiction or community moves from point A to point B is the change described in this webinar. I've had conversations with uh, criminal justice professionals, including law enforcement, and they've been the first to describe that the criminal justice system has historically been somewhat resistant to change. Um, perhaps because of this resistance around the term change, we don't have much written about it or the ways in which change comes about in the criminal justice field. Um, additionally, in discussing change in the criminal justice context, it's often complicated by assumptions or realities about the forces driving that change. However, in this webinar, we want to focus on the ways in which the demand for change can produce innovative best practices. We've seen this across the nation as communities begin to address their untested sexual assault kits. As change happens and new practices are explored, innovation follows. We're joined today by two of the leaders in our field, Lieutenant Knowlton and Anna Wally from the Memphis community, who work to thoughtfully engage and notify victims in sexual assault cases about the new forensic evidence from their sexual assault kits. So today, in talking about change, we'll focus on how it was carried out in Memphis, how they approach the needs, and the lessons learned from their practices, and we'll discuss this using the Readiness for Change model. Here's a visual of the steps or components of Readiness for Change. I'll be brief about the academic part, but in the download section, you'll be able to find pre-reading. Um, which has a further explanation of the model and its theoretical origins. In looking at change, we've considered a framework that would be helpful to assist with planning and preparing for victim notification. Uh, in other fields, readiness for change is used to explain uh, the integration of evidence-based practice um, and moving practice wisdom, or what we know works in the field, um, to our work with our clients, in our case, working with survivors of sexual assault. Um, the theory is most often used in healthcare and mental health and substance abuse programs, with only a few mentions of it in criminal justice context. So in applying the theory to notification, our goal is to describe and explain the ways in which change was carried out, including the examination of personal, institutional, and organizational factors that move us toward best practices for notification. Here's the visual once we add in each of the meanings for these components of change. And we'll talk about each one and how it's defined. Uh, and Lieutenant Knowlton and Anna will describe how it happened in concrete practice examples. Uh, keep in mind that the change is fluid and sometimes has overlapping steps, so they're not mutually exclusive. And we will start with contextual factors. These are the factors that influence the organization or community's ability to complete change, like the culture, the resources and structure, policies and procedures, uh, past experiences, history of the problem in the community, and the community's perception of the organization um, or the issue, the problem. So I'm going to invite Lieutenant Knowlton and Anna to discuss examples from their experiences in working together on victim notification in Memphis in terms of the context in which they were working. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, one, one of the issues that we, we had to address in Memphis was the demographics. And in Memphis, we have a, a upwards of 60% African American uh, demographic. Uh, and historically, uh, the African Americans in our area do not trust police. I guess that's true for most areas, but 
as we see in our community now. So that was the overall picture of trust from police that we were actually going to handle and do a good job without any smoke and mirrors or any any play on words. We were really going to be trust trustworthy and handle the problem, test our kids, investigate the kids, and treat our victims with uh, with dignity. That also influenced how we decided to actually do the notifications because we believed if uh, in our community it would not work well to call somebody up and say, hey, we're the police and we're here to help you. And um, we thought it better to show up at the victim's home and with and with the advocate and a police officer. And even though that has a little bit of a negative impact initially because they weren't expecting us, it has worked really well in terms of being able to get in touch with people. Uh, there has been an ongoing relationship between the Memphis Police Department and the uh, Rape Crisis Center for 41 years. We started 41 years ago. And it, we're a little different than many communities because it's sort of a mix between community and systems advocacy. But we work directly with the police department every day on our, our rape crisis, on our kits and um, cases. So we do have that history that we're building on. All right, we're going to move on to our next one. Um, given what we just heard about the context in which Memphis was working with, in, the environmental factors, the historical factors, um, we're going to introduce now the idea for the catalyst for the change, um, which is the need or the demand for the change. In other words, it's the change agent that brings critical attention in some way um, that requires a response and action. Um, in some communities, that may have been the discovery or realization that the untested sexual assault kits existed. In others, it may have been um, a, a new legislation that was passed. Um, so, Lieutenant Knowlton and Anna, what do the what did the catalyst for change look like for you in Memphis? Um, well, we had the same as many places around the country. Um, we also had the, the, the interest nationwide, and then there um, was a, some media pressure here that came from one of the, the channels, the TV channels. And we also had a lawsuit, which put some pressure on. Um, and that got some, ed, some quick, ed, quick action from our, from our then mayor for the city. Yeah, and with that attention, um, they gave us the opportunity to, to react um, to the large inventory that we had. We had to determine uh, how many kits, uh, because it was a na national interest and a statewide interest that we would have to report to our uh, congressman how many uh, kits we had and how many and what level of testing, and then how would we address the problem. Uh, so it, it made it um, necessary for us. And the, with the backing from the mayor and all the division, he, division heads, we were able to um, come up with good ideas and a good plan to address our untested kids. And our city council also provided funding so that we could do some of that work in addition to the work that we were already doing. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention our uh, county mayor, because we have two mayors in Memphis, uh, who also allowed our staff to um, put energy towards this project. Um, so at this point, I would like to kind of take a step back and provide an opportunity for our audience to give us a little bit of information about um, what this looked like in their community. So our question to you is, in your community, what was the, was the drive for testing the sexual assault kits from internal or external demands? So we've broken this up more than 50% internal. So it was motivated by internal leaders um, or professionals. Um, second option is more than 50% external. So these external pressures, um, similar to what Lieutenant Knowlton and Anna described, um, the community demands, the media demands, um, or equally internal or external. Um, and if none of these, uh, you can type in your 
answer into the, the Q&A pod so we can get a better understanding of those. One of the things okay. in Memphis, we were de delighted to have that support because we had been wanting to do these things and didn't have the will or the money to do so, so it was very nice when that, both those things happened. So in, in appropriately responding to the demand, there were funding and support um, that came in a variety of ways so that you're able then to um, have enough resources and buy in an investment into the issues that you can mobilize and respond. And from our poll, we're seeing a variety of responses. Um, communities are being called to action for a bunch of different reasons, which can then impact the way, the ways in which you respond. Did you have another comment, Lieutenant Knowlton or Anna? We did um, also receive a lot of support from Joyful Heart, and they were able to help legitimize the efforts that we were making in Memphis. And that proved very helpful because there was somebody from out of town saying that what we did were doing made sense. And, and that was a very helpful thing to have when we were going to the public with our plans. Support from a nationally based organization um, that does wonderful work. Yeah. Great. All right, so we're going to move on now to our next step. In addition to the catalyst for change, there are other elements um, present that impact the response and the ways in which we change and evolve. Um, and one of those is personal readiness for change, which is about how much the professionals, the individuals at the organizations um, and in your community value that change based on their own professional commitments and beliefs and motivations. Lieutenant Knowlton and Anna, can you talk about what the personal looked like in Memphis? And at Memphis, we were really lucky to have almost the perfect storm of people in place to make some of these changes. The administrative staff at the Memphis Police Department got on board very quickly with the notion of every victim counts. Uh, so our, the command staff there, particularly um, currently Deputy Director uh, Mike Ryle, really took this thought to heart and helped us support that throughout all the levels in the police department. Because we have, so you've got Memphis government, Memphis Police Department, the Attorney General's Office, the rape crisis people from the, the county. So you had to get the buy-in on every level. And we were very glad that we had people that were already familiar with the notion of victim-centered treatment, victim-centered casework. So they were committed to making sure that victims felt heard and understood. Uh, one thing, too, that, um, that became really obvious is that the police department was willing to admit that they had made mistakes on some cases in the past, perhaps not following through enough or perhaps in the way that the uh, officers interacted with victims. And that was extremely powerful. So when victims are talking to, to the officers that are doing notifications, they'll say, you know, I didn't like the way I was treated back in 2005. And the officers, instead of arguing or trying to explain it away, they say, you know, I looked at your case, and it could have been done better. We're going to take care of it the right way this time. And not only that, we also, um, we also instruct our investigators to don't be afraid to say I'm sorry. And uh, we're not going to make any excuses for the treatment that the victim uh, received in the past, uh, but we're going to do our best to investigate this case to the fullest. Uh, we, we ask that they be as honest as possible, uh, be as forthcoming as possible with the victim, and, um, and because we're trying to rebuild trust and uh, where trust is not there. And um, the victims respond well to that. They respond well when we come in. Uh, we're not in police uniform, so we're not intimidating. Uh, we have um, police officers of all sizes, men, women, big men, little men. <laughs> and the big guys seem to do better, uh, actually, uh, but they're out of uniform. And they handle the victims with kid gloves. And uh, they, their goal is to first build a rapport with that victim so that they will feel comfortable with going forward with the case. Uh, and then we think outside of the box. We don't always want to just be like um, 
Joe Friday and just the facts, ma'am. Uh, we, we're going to talk about uh, what's going on with you even now. Uh, as officers, we even ask about how did that make you feel uh, at the time? What did you smell? And that we're asking them to do that, things that are way outside of the, the realm of general policing. Uh, so, but, and the victims respond well to that. Um, they feel safe. They say that. I felt safe with him. I felt uh, that he was going to work on my behalf. I could tell he was listening by the way he made eye contact. Right. All the things that, that we as social workers learn to do, the offices are learning and it, they're doing a great job with it. And that's a great testament with us working together because otherwise as, as police officers we, we don't see the need for that uh, because our training is just how to stay safe, how to get the information. and this helps us in getting the information, but that's not the way it's traditional policing is done. Uh, so we see that it works now, and our officers are able to get much more information and much more help from the victim uh, because of how they deal and interact with them. So with this component of the change, you see a real coming together of the personal and the professional, the intersection there and how important um, that personal connection and the rapport building and the validation of the survivor's experience um, through the engagement is critical to, to their engagement in the criminal justice system um, and potentially on their pathway to healing. That's, that's correct. And not all officers are there the moment they hit the unit. Some of them observe and learn it. So it's a, it's a growing process. And of course, in um, law enforcement, we have people that are, uh, that we have some staff changes now and again. So we have new people that come in. But what's great is the officers who've been there a while are kind of mentoring the other ones that are coming in and explaining to them why this approach works for police as well as for the victim. Um, and we have a comment from Nancy who's reiterating um, that this, this component of the change around this personal connection um, helps with around the survivors need to talk, to um, give their account, to tell their story, um, and how that can have a, a critical impact on their experience. Thanks for those comments, Nancy. So we'll move on to um, a polling question to engage in um, some more conversation with our audience. Um, so this one is around that personal readiness for change to kind of get a sense of who's in the room and your work. Um, to what degree do I believe that we must integrate and uphold victim-centered practices in daily work? Not at all. Victim-centered practice is not part of my role. Somewhat. I try to incorporate victim-centered practice, but other factors compete with my ability to do so. Completely. Victim centeredness is my first or one of my top priorities and unsure. So we have a majority where um, victim centeredness and the elements of that approach um, of having victims be at the center of all the decisions that are made um, is a top priority for most of our audience members. And a few where it's somewhat, where there are other factors that um, compete with the time, resources, and attention that are required to do victim-centered practice well. All right. Thank you for your responses. We'll move on to um, the next component in the change process. So in addition to responding to the demand, the personal component of the change the personal component that's required for the change to happen, we have some of what we've talked about already, our institutional readiness for change, so our organization's change. Um, and these can include um, some of the practical elements that Lieutenant Nelson and Anna were already talking about, the funding, the resources, the demands on our already um, overtaxed time, um, as well as the knowledge and the resources required to um, obtain additional funding. So we talked about it a little bit, but can 
Lieutenant Knowlton and Anna, can you talk a little bit more in depth about um, what this looked like for the organizations and some of the preliminary measures uh, taken to meet the, um, the requirements for the demand? You know, at the Rape Crisis Center, we had to make the commitment to have staff available to work with these victims. In addition to, uh, we're already overwhelmed with people that are working on current cases with. So there had to be a commitment that we would uh, locate resources, if not use resources we currently have. So we kind of blended that so that at any point in time, somebody from the Memphis Police Department calls us, we can have somebody available to go out and help them. So the our, we were already working towards the victim-centered approach here, and this helped us further on down the line. And for the Memphis Police Department, we uh, were very fortunate in that the, ma the mayor um, was committed to this project. And uh, from the mayor down to our director and our division uh, commanders, uh, we, they decided to uh, dedicate a DNA unit. So our complement now is, is 14, and we have 14 investigators um, and two supervisors. And I know my major, my supervisor thinks he, this is primarily all he does, but uh, he, his time is spread across some other things. But those, out of those 16 people were completely dedicated to this project, just with the Memphis Police Department. Uh, but not only that, the AG's office uh, dedicates uh, two people now. Uh, to prosecuting with an, in, an investigator that is dedicated to the project. And then even with our lab, our state lab, uh, we have a representative lab director comes to our meeting every week. And so all of our issues that, uh, that may come up, we discuss it once a week. Uh, and we actually have two teams, uh, which is, I think, a little different than most places, but we have a team that meets uh, earlier uh, on Friday, both t both meets on Friday, one week every week, the other every two weeks, and I call them the micro and the macro, but uh, the boots on the ground, the working group, are would be the personnel from MPD, rape crisis, which would include the counselors and, and nurse the and advocates, and advocates. Um, the AG's office, TBI, uh, Shelby County, uh, personnel with someone from a, a surrounding agency in the county. And uh, we come and we discuss a number, any issue dealing with our project. And from then specific cases to how we're handling things. Exactly. One of the things that we were, was a lucky coincidence, I think, for us, is that right before this all came about, the, there were people at MPD and the Rape Crisis Center already developing, working towards a protocol to work with um, cases that were had been processed much later than the rape itself. So we had built on the work from um, from Detroit, from the Michigan 400 project, and so we were able to try and build on what other people were already doing well, and also to develop some of our own way to work with our particular victims. So I'm, so there were, um, a real acknowledgement and attention put towards the issue. So it was um, resources from within the organization, kind of a reprioritization um, around effort, um, an acknowledgement that in order to do the work well and use a victim-centered framework, um, that many levels um, from the macro to the micro had to be involved um, in each step, in each phase of um, planning for the victim notification protocol and for that victim notification to start happening in Memphis. Yes, and the leader of our, our large task force was very active in, in getting resources for us. He worked with the city uh, council and the mayor to get grants so that we could continue with the work we did. So um, it was really a, a, a group that came together, I think, very quickly and, and surprisingly easily to get these things done once the commitment had been made towards the victim-centered approach and that every victim counts. So not only the time and the funds, but also the right people to build that investment in the issue. So at this time, I'd like to pull up another polling question. Um, this will be our, our last poll for the webinar presentation. But we want to get a sense of 
of how this would work or how it's working in, in our audience members' communities. So without sufficient resources to meet the demands this will have on our organization, what's the best strategy or the first strategy uh, to, in, to acquire or leverage resources? What would be your first approach? Collaborate with partner organizations. Seek new funding, whether that's state, federal, um, foundation. Prioritize this initiative and reallocate resources to fund or other. And you can type in the, in the chat box. So it looks like it, the answers are across the board. Um, there might, and this question also might be a little unfair because I, in reality, it's a, uh, a combination of all of these approaches. But the, the poll's changing a little bit. It looks like that multidisciplinary approach of collaborating with partner organizations is where our audience members would kind of prioritize their efforts to make the changes required. Thanks for participating in the poll. All right. So we'll move on to the next step of the combination of these three elements leading to the organizational readiness for change. Um, so it's the meeting point of all of these three factors that we've talked about so far. Um, it's where the personal and the institutional meet with the catalyst. So in this discussion, we're referring to the term organization as a multidisciplinary working group instead of a single organization um, because we know that the coordinated community response um, whether that's a SART or a task force, is required to address all the tasks involved with the sexual assault kits and with victim notification and engagement um, so that the multidisciplinary group moves forward together to make change. Um, and given the synthesis of these elements, um, Lieutenant Knowlton and Anna, can you talk about what this readiness looked like in Memphis? One thing, this is Anna, that I learned years ago from a friend of mine, David Ebinger, who's now a police captain up in uh, Minnesota. I was developing training with him on domestic violence, and the advocates in the room were saying, we have to start with the, the dynamics of domestic violence. We, the officers have to understand that first, and that's what we need to teach them first. And he corrected us, I think, appropriately and said, no, what you need to come with first to police officers in how doing this in a victim-centered way will improve their likelihood of catching the person and putting them in jail. So it's a what's in it for them approach with the police as it's what's in it for them for us as well. We all want to see the bad guys in jail, but we don't have to speak the same language to get there. So I thought it was really important that we communicate that by doing these notifications, it will increase in your ability to do your police work, which will lead to the in better investigations. Also having the multidisciplinary team, um, right away we realized that it was going to be, uh, especially from the media in our area, some blame game. And we came together to discuss the problem, um, the issues that we, ha we would have with the the problem, and uh, we just decided that, that trying to figure out who was the blame and pointing mm -hmm. fingers was counterproductive and that we needed to move forward swiftly and make decisions about how to address and come up with a solution for it, and um, blaming and pointing fingers was going to be counterproductive. So uh, once we came to that agreement, we moved forward very quickly and then we had to be respectful and trust each other and your discipline. So I'm not trying to be a social worker. Exactly. Uh, and um, Anna's not trying to be the police. We work together and each of us have a position and a job to do. It, it has the same goal, but everybody has a job to do. And we, we just want to trust that that person does their job and they're going to trust us. So we. Uh, coming together and with the multidisciplinary team meeting every week, getting to know each other, it, w it became easy to trust and it became easy to, easier to stay in your lane. Yes. We had an easier time actually with the working group, I think, and how we worked together because we were used to doing that. 
with the larger task force, we had to come to an agreement that uh, if questioned by the media, we're not going to respond to questions. I wouldn't respond to questions about the police department and that they wouldn't tell what rape crisis does and vice versa. So we didn't want any of the members to speak for something they weren't totally aware of. So we had to, to come up with some rules as we went along. And that's worked out well. It's worked out much better to be open and direct than it is, you know, to do the behind the back kind of stuff. We've also we've sustained the commitment for now what three years that we've been working on this. So we are still meeting weekly. So that commitment is still there. So in all in in at this point in the change process with all of the context and the um, the personal and the organizational readiness to respond to this, um, the multidisciplinary group was working together, communicating in effective ways, um, and continuing to um, invest in an approach that would be um, helpful and engaging survivors in order to move these cases, the sexual assault cases, uh, potentially through the criminal justice system. And if not, then providing um, the information and resources to survivors so that they could make um, choices about their engagement. Yes, and all the conversations haven't been pleasant. Um, I don't think anybody's yelled at each other and nobody's called anybody names, but sometimes it's a little uncomfortable and that's okay because change sometimes is a little uncomfortable. So we'll bring things up and maybe not finish that discussion until the next week or think about it and try to come up with another way to work. And that, that's changed as the process has gone on. The further it's gone on, the more cases have come for the police to investigate. Our cases are now going to trial with the prosecutors. They're getting overwhelmed. So we have to be cognizant of everybody's limitations as well. And, and where, where folks are in the process and allow that, you know, some of the conversations to percolate so that reflection can happen before moving forward and making exactly. decisions together. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's move on to the next step in the readiness for change model. Um, this is ch the actual change implementation. Um, now, um, I acknowledge that there, there has been um, these forms of change, um, the preliminary change, and the communication happening. Um, and this is the, the real practice change where the notification comes in. Um, so now that the multidisciplinary group has set itself up in ways that prepare for the change, um, the change implementation is the exploratory action taken to address the issue um, and do the notification. Um, and that's the adoption of change through um, leadership decisions that are made and then um, are tasked to the advocates and to the um, investigators and so forth. Um, and the actual implementation of this change in the practice. So Lieutenant Nelson and Anna, can you talk a little bit about the, the notification changes that were happening for Memphis? Um, so we've been doing this for a while with the investigator going out with either an advocate or a counselor from the Rape Crisis Center. Um, and we have also done some polling with the victims after we've done the notification because we want to know if our perception of how it's going is the same as theirs. And it really has been pretty close. The victims say that Yes, they were surprised and scared at the beginning of, an, of a notification, but then they realized that these people were here to help them. So we've been very pleased to see that the victim perception is the same as ours. Um, we've done several different things within the, um, within the, the group, and um, one of the things that we did was set up a hotline at the police department. What we decided, when we decided who we would do notification with, we looked at um, how do we empower victims. And we didn't think it was necessarily going to be helpful to a victim if we came out to see them and said, yes, we tested your rape kit. Nothing's new. We couldn't get any evidence. See you later. That didn't seem like it was a helpful thing. But we wanted every victim to be able to call and get the information if they wanted it. So we now have a hotline number where victims can call and find out what the result of the testing was. 
So we've decided to notify in four different situations. One is if DNA is found, and, and we are able now to um, indict using the DNA as the identifier. If the person is identified, we notify the victim to let them know who the person was and what their status is, if they're currently in jail or not. If, somebody's, if the person whose DNA showed up is in jail for decades to come, we tell the victim that so they don't have to be looking over their shoulder. And we also notify them in case the perpetrator, if the perpetrator has died, because then they don't need to worry either. So I think that's been, that was how we came about, trying to keep the victim empowered, but also um, notify people when they needed to be notified. And I think the um, most important thing is that we came together as a group. Even with we developed a, just a checklist of everything that when once an officer answered because the DNA hotline uh, rings in the uh, um, MPD's office. So when an investigator answers the phone, we developed a, just, just a little script. A little yeah. script. And um, that we, we didn't want to go on our own with that because as police officers, we are just that black and white, just the facts, ma'am. And uh, we wanted to be, even in, at that point, as victim-centered as possible and, and to give them as much information as possible that they still have access to uh, uh, free and confidential counseling and to give them the number for the Rape Crisis Center here and refer them uh, so that they could have access to that. So um, all of that, we came together as a group, and we included Joyful Heart. Uh, the Rape Crisis Center uh, sat down and wrote, wrote out the script for us because we just didn't want to leave, leave ourselves, leave it to our own devices, and it would not be um, as victim-centered as we needed to. So that, that was had. a great thing. Yeah. Um, and for those of y'all who've been in the field quite a while, I've been here a while, and that wouldn't have happened 10 or 15 years ago. They wouldn't have said, can you please help us write the script so that we don't say anything inadvertently that's victim blaming or anything that's going to put make people feel uncomfortable. So that's the advantage of working in the weekly group is that we see each other's strengths. And we tend to, I think in Memphis, we focus on the strengths right. more than the problems. And then even as we go, even as, as we have progressed through our project, we use those meetings to come together, and as Anna said earlier, sometimes the discussions we have are not comfortable. And um, so sometimes there, there may be issues that come about, and we discuss those. And uh, we're just holding each other accountable uh, for what we came together as a group and decided upon. Hey, you know, I know that this person, this is what we decided to do. This person is not following that. And so this is something that we need to know. Because if we're going to uh, make it a policy and have policy change within our department, then we want to be held accountable. And, and that's the best and safest place to have that happen. Yeah, to that end, one of the things we've done in the, just the past few months is to, to have a review on each of the cases that come through. And we have staff there from the police department, the attorney general's office, uh, usually also the, rape, um, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, and Rape Crisis Center. We have a nurse there as well as advocates so that everybody hears the same thing, why we're not going to go forward on a particular case, why we can't go forward if it's a statute of limitation, or why we should go out. So we're asking questions like, did you take an advocate with you when you went on that notification? So all of the, um, all of the officers know that they're going to be asked that question, so they know that they'll be held accountable for following the protocol. And, and that's the same for all the staff. We have one question from the audience. Are the attorneys that are working on, uh, that are designated to the cold cases, the two I believe you said, are they designated, mandated, or voluntary? How does that process work? Um, I think they're designated. They, would they have a special victims unit in the Attorney General's office that works with sexual assaults, child abuse, and elder abuse. So they're in the, within that unit. And um, the, the Attorney General sometimes moves people around but I believe all the people that have come in there have expressed an interest in being there. So we haven't had anybody who is um, who is not. It's a personal, professional investment, and they're specialized in, and have training um, in these cases and working with these survivors. They have some. You know, we could always see them having more. And they, what's nice is that they have the advocates and they have the police who can kind of say, well, you know, generally we want to do it differently. 
or is there a way we could um, notify the victim sooner so they'd know they were going to court? So we're, we're always kind of bouncing things off each other to try and do it in the most uh, effective and victim-centered way. And that is a great segue into the next part of the Readiness for Change model, which um, you've been talking about a little bit, which is the, the assessment component. Um, so once the exploratory action and the initial efforts for change um, are happening, um, the assessment includes evaluating and assessing the actions taken and looking for those opportunities for improvement and lessons learned. Um, and then looping back on, on that information and modifying, adjusting the actions. Um, and this can be formal uh, or informal in nature. Um, so it does not have to be um, formal research researchers um, involved in the process. It can be a self-driven um, process for improving the quality of the victim engagement um, and the notification procedures. Um, so you've talked about these, um, some of the meetings that were happening and holding um, the investigators accountable. Tell us a little bit more about some more of the lessons learned through your assessment process. Uh, one of the things is that we, when we do training, and we've had the opportunity and funding to bring people in to do training with us, including um, Dr. Rebecca Campbell and some other people about the uh, neurobiology of trauma, other things like that. We've included, besides just the DNA, people that are working with it, just the officers and just our staff who work with DNA, we're involving the folks with the current cases as well so that we spread the knowledge across the, the system and not just keep it um, focused on the ones from the old cases. So I think that's been really a helpful thing and it helps uh, us again see how we can work together more closely to get things done. We've been having a, the quarterly lunch and learn and we've been asking for feedback from the investigators and advocates. I don't think we've gotten as much as we would like. I think sometimes they don't feel comfortable discussing it in the open, but uh, we want to know what's working well and what could we do better um, because that's the way, the only way we're going to know is from them. So I think maybe afterwards they may talk to their uh, command staff instead of saying it in open in the group. But we have gotten a little bit of feedback, but I'd like to get more. Yeah, one, one of the biggest changes just throughout the process, uh, I think Anna did touch on that on the last slide, was that we do the case review. And that was in response to the advocates not really understanding why we weren't going forward with the case. Because they, in the past, they were not included in that decision. They weren't in the room. So they would get that information secondhand and the, and the interpretation of whatever that decision was. So in direct response to that, we added yet another meeting and um, to, to do case review. And it's just been invaluable because uh, it does actually empower <laughs> the, um, the advocates and, and it helps them feel like their, their job is just a little bit, which it always was, but it, it is very important. Um, and they do have an input on the outcome of the case. Uh, because many times we think that it's just the AG, that it's the AG's decision. And uh, we want to make sure that um, they get all of the information that's possible. So if anything that the advocate has to say, she may have to add, she can say that at that review meeting. And, um, you know, we all don't want, need another meeting, but it just was necessary. And it, it just helped with our accountability, and it helped um, – the officers own up to whatever it is that the decision was and how they presented the case. And how they can learn from each other by that exactly. as well. So we may have an officer that said, yeah, I drove out there a couple of times. And then you have other officers saying, well, I went at different times of the day and we went on the weekend. So they learn from each other as well. And I think that's, that's great. The other thing is that sometimes it's as small a thing as, well, let's not give up yet. Let's keep trying to reach them a little longer. So um, we really do work well together. Again, it's not always comfortable. Uh, sometimes, you know, I take the role of the bad guy of asking the hard questions because that's my job. So we want to ask the hard questions in a way that we can, can do it better, in a way that we can um, make sure we have the best outcomes for everyone. And you've talked throughout, too, about um, some of the 
the, the feedback loops and getting input from um, on neurobiology from Becky Campbell and getting the input from Joyful Heart and getting input from all of the practitioners in your community about um, the ways forward and adjustments that can be made so that the, um, the outcomes can be better. So wonderfully and said. Very importantly from the victims because we don't know for sure unless we ask how they're responding. I see a question about how we adjusted our resources. Um, one of the things uh, to be able to respond to people, current cases and the older cases, one of, some of the stuff we did was training of more staff, some cross-training, so that if there comes a time when a police officer needs somebody to go out in a hurry and the two designated people are not available, we can have some fallback folks that can, can do the notifications. And the staff really enjoys going out on the notification. Um, and being with police officers, it's very helpful to learn how the police work. And it's a, it's, it's a kind of a high adrenaline thing because you don't know if the victim is going to have a very emotional reaction, have no reaction. So it's an interesting thing for the advocates to be in that position as well. And I think that all of us across the agency have learned a lot from this experience. And I appreciate the, you coming back to getting that information um, from the survivor about their experience and going back to ask them to hear from them um, about what's working and what's not working. And al then also learning from those interactions of notification. Um, As a result of this, also we de are developing a treatment program. Uh, a while back I was trying to do research on work what works well with these victims who may have been assaulted 10 years ago and there's not much written about it. So we're working on um, a research project with the University of Memphis to look at whether or not cognitive processing therapy is going to be a good tool to use with these folks. We think it will, but we're doing a fairly strenuous research model so we can have some proof and proof that we can share around the country. That's great news. Um, so we are um, doing a time check and we have just a few minutes left. So I'm going to move on to our last slide around our concluding remarks. Um, so in the assessment, in the last part of the readiness for change model, um, like I said, it's fluid. It can be informal or, or formal, um, informal throughout the process. And now, as Anna described, um, formal um, and of formalizing of the research around a particular intervention, um, which may be really helpful and valuable for working with survivors. Um, and the organizations can involved in making this change across the country are can continue to explore the actions um, given the lessons that they've learned in practice and adjusting um, their efforts based on what they're learning. Um, and this framework, we're hoping, can be used um, for any multidisciplinary group across the country to reflect on the process for change. Um, so the pre-reading in the download section provides a step-by-step -step series of guiding questions about implementing change in your community. Um, and as we conclude, it's important to come back to these two questions on your screen. What are the goals and objectives for your community with regard to sexual assault kits and notification? And what kind of change do you want to achieve with regard to victim notification and engagement? Um, so I want to thank Lieutenant Knowlton and Anna for walking us through their process and sharing their experiences with us today um, and conclude with a few points that were mentioned but which were also part of um, some of the experience um, that we had as a research team working in Houston, um, which were that change is a process, it's not an event. Um, so playing the long game and developing those relationships is critical. Blame is certainly not helpful. Um, and looking forward is also really important and agreeing to stay engaged with each other to solve the problem and move forward with creating change. So I'd like to turn it over for any final remarks to um, Lieutenant Knowlton and Anna before we um, give you a few resources as we head out today. Uh, this is Anna. I would say that I'm happy to take calls or uh, email communication if anybody has some other questions. Um, you can find my number if you search for Shelby County Rape Crisis Center in Memphis. That would be my number.
And I as well, uh, Lieutenant Knowlton is kind of new to me, so I struggle with not saying sergeant. But Lieutenant Knowlton, um, I'm available for any any questions or any way I can be helpful to any of the cities. Uh, but I think what's been very critical for our organization or for our project is the multidisciplinary team. For us having uh, professionals that come together and willing to lend their expertise in their from their area, and uh, that's just been key to how far we've come with our project. If we would not have had that, we would still be at the beginning. We also have learned a lot from other cities, and I know that at the end of September there's a summit in Detroit that's going to be held there to, for different groups that are working on this process. And learning from how other people have done it, you can see a, a broad variety of techniques and what's worked for one community might not work for ours. But we have learned a whole lot, and we um, I recommend that people attend that summit. Thank you again. We have a few other resources. Um, if you have technical assistance questions, please feel free to reach out to me. And we're going to have a guide coming out this fall with all of the information from all of our webinars, which are also archived on our website. You can find the links there. And I'd like to plug the um, Sexual Assault Kit Initiative Training and Technical Assistance Project is having a webinar next week um, with professionals from RAIN and Joyful Heart Foundation talking about strategies for victim notification. Um, and this is not a live, oh, it is live link, I think. So if you have questions about getting that information, just let me know. Okay, so that will conclude our session. I want to thank our speakers for their participation and all of our registrants who attended today's program. You can register for on-demand recordings of past webinars and upcoming programs at utaustinsocialworkceu.org. Thanks again for joining us, and have a wonderful day.